Thank you, Samuel, and the Praise Band Ministry. I uh, want to tell you a story about a man by the name of Rob. Rob came to a church. He got involved at the church um, after a stint in prison. And it was um, while in prison that God really got a hold of his life. And uh, Rob came out of a very rough background, um, but God spoke to him in prison and really showed him that uh, there, was, there was a better lifestyle for him. And uh, Rob's story is shared in this book called Letters to the Church by a man by the name of Francis Chan. Maybe you've heard of him, pastor. A uh, really good book. But anyway, he shares this story. I thought it was really interesting. Rob says, he tells me stories of gang life and the fear that he felt when he left his gang to join the body of Christ. To do this in prison can be suicidal. He had to make a serious break with his gang. And gangs are anything but casual about break, uh, breaking those ties. But the Lord intervened to spare his life. It wasn't just the physical torture or death he feared. He dreaded the rejection by those he loved. The gang was his family. These were loyal and dear friends who looked out for him 24 hours a day. There was a love and a camaraderie from being in a gang that he had enjoyed since childhood. Now he would lose those relationships and be hated by them all. When Rob describes gang life, much of it sounds like what the church was meant to be. Obviously, there are major differences, drugs, murder, you know, little details like that. But the idea of being a family is central to both gang life and God's design for the church. Yet while we use family terminology in our churches, Rob's stories have convinced me that gangs have a much stronger sense of what it means to be a family than we do in the church. From what we know about gangs, could you ever imagine gang life being reduced to a weekly one-hour gathering? No group would meet briefly once a week and call that a gang. Imagine one gang member walking up to another one and saying, yo, how was gang? I had to miss this week because life was crazy. We all know enough about gangs to know that's ridiculous. Yet every week we hear Christians asking each other, how was church? Something that God has designed to function as a family has been reduced to an optional weekly meeting. And this has become normal, expected. How in the world did we get here? Any gang member will tell you his homies have his back. They're there for him. They're loyal, committed, present. Meanwhile, in many churches, you have about as much of a connection to the people who are supposedly your spiritual family as you would to somebody who visited the same movie theater as you. I read that section, and it was like, put the brakes on, stop. It really hit me. How much does coming to church feel like going to the movies with somebody? We go, we observe, we like the movie, we didn't like the movie, we laugh with the movie, we maybe cry with the movie. We don't admit that we cried with the movie though, but you know, we, we go through all these things and then finally we get done and we leave and did we really become the church? Because we observe the same music and the same sermon together. So why are we doing this series called 1025? Well, the obvious reason is because we changed our time to 1025. <laughs> but it's bigger than that. The section in Hebrews 1025, if you can turn there, please. Maybe you have it memorized by now. Hebrews is toward the end of your Bible. Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. So it's pretty close to the end. Hebrews chapter 11, I'm sorry, 10, verse 25. It says this, let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. 
It's a pretty simple verse loaded with a lot of context, which we just haven't had even, even taking one verse, we really needed to spend longer on diving into the initial parts of 19 through 24 and then 26 through the end of the chapter. There's tons and tons and tons of stuff here. But even with that being said, what we've really been focusing on is let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It's become very clear in modern day church, especially church in America, that the, the, the need to gather as the church and the need to be together seems like it's becoming less and less important. In fact, uh, most sociologists will say that we are now living not, in a, not just in, a, in an America that is postmodern, but actually what we are living in is a post-Christian America now. It's like we moved on from Christianity. No longer can you just assume that most people know who Jesus is. Most people do, but you can't assume that everybody does like, to, like it used to be. And as this thing continues to go, as it continues to press on, we, we hear this and we're like, okay, yeah, I know I should be, but it becomes something where gathering takes time and it takes effort, and man, I could be sleeping in, and I could be doing this. And by the way, they just want to meddle in my business anyway, and I really don't want to deal with that. So we just drift off. Some are in the habit of doing that. But last week we talked about let us encourage one another. And, and if you remember from last week, I talked about two parts of encouragement. The two parts of encouragement that we're supposed to give each other is like I said last week, gospel-centered comfort and gospel-centered exhortation. Somebody this past week said to me, I, I, I understood what the gospel-centered comfort mean, but I really didn't understand what gospel-centered exhortation meant. It's just not a word that I use all the time. So I said, okay, this is the way I would describe it. Gospel-centered comfort, a pat on the back. It's good. We can do this. Jesus loves you just the way you are. If you understand who Jesus is, your sins are paid for, past, present, future. You are loved. Your hope is secure. That's the sort of comfort that we need, especially when we realize that we blew it for the same thing over again, and we told God we'd never do it again. And we need that comfort. We need that encouragement when life is hard. We need that pat on the back. It's okay. Gospel-centered exhortation is a kick in the pants. Okay? We need the pats on the back, and we need the kicks in the pants. And what would it be like to have a people that you know that love you just the way you are, and that they love you so much they don't want to let you stay that way? See, we've, we've bought into this line, that, that this idea of, of calling maybe somebody out is judging them, right? Oh, you're judging me. Well, you know what? Yeah, I've judged based on what Scripture says, and I've realized based on what the Bible says, your life is doing this, and if I don't say anything, how loving is that to go, well, I hope, hope the bottom feels good when you get there. Isn't it more loving to say, hey, I'm concerned, I love you just the way you are, but I'm concerned that the path you're on is taking you this way, and because I love you, I'm willing to say something. What would it be like to have a church that looks like that. And that's what we said. Let's not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another, willing to give pats on the back and kicks in the pants when necessary. And then the verse goes on. Let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. All the more as you see the day approaching. What does this even mean? It's interesting, if you look at the, uh, the, the Israel church as they had come out of, uh, Jesus had died and he was buried and he rose again, and as the kingdom church was being established here on the earth, and that was God's plan to reach the world through the nation of Israel, through a restored, powerful nation of Israel. That was the plan, and this thing is rolling out. We read in Acts 2.42 in this, this kingdom church, as they are getting ready and they're preparing, and it says they would meet every day. They would meet daily in this, and they would come together, and they would talk, and they would encourage each other. Why? Because there was a recognition that the days they were living in were tough. And they knew they needed, they needed the support of the body of Christ. They needed the support of, of, of other believers. And so as we go through this, in our minds, we look and we say, okay, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the, as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another. All right, I'll show up every Sunday, Pastor. If that's what you're saying, I'll make it a point to be here at least three times a month. Is that fair for you? Is that good to get you off my back, Pastor? 
Well, that's kind of not what I'm talking about. You see, here's what I'm telling you today. Christians need ongoing encouragement from one another. Last week we talked about the what does the encouragement mean. Two parts, comfort and exhortation. Pat on the back, kick in the pants. This week it's the why. It's the why. Why do we need to do this for other people? The writer of Hebrews, and once again, we don't really know exactly who he is. He tells us, let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. And so I want to give you just two points once again today. Keep it simple. I want to give you just a couple reasons. Reason number one that we need to give, give ongoing encouragement to one another is to make the most of today. To make the most of today. With that in mind, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Ephesians 5. There is so much in this section. We're just going to skip the one set of verses here because it deals with our word here. But He's talking about, you know, now that you've understood the doctrine of, of why this day and age that we're living in matters tremendously, let me give you some of the practical ways of working it out. Chapter 1 through 3 is doctrine. Chapters 4 through 6 is practicality. And so he goes 4 and 5, and he's leading up to this, and he says, be very careful then, verse 15, Chapter 5, verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because, and here's our word, the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think through this here because this is, this is something that I, I've oftentimes just thought. In fact, I've preached this passage numerous times. When I read through this, it says, okay, therefore make the most of every opportunity. The word there, make the most of the opportunity, is, is this idea of walking around. Be very careful how you walk around. How many of you in this room would define yourself as a klutz? Okay, a few people here. Okay, you're the type of person who it seems like things jump out and grab you as you walk around, right? Yeah. And so oftentimes, and so for me, one of the things that you will rarely ever see me do is wear flip-flops with my toes sticking out. I will wear keens because I like my toes being covered. I will wear tennis shoes. I'll wear what rarely do I have my toes sticking out because there's this thing in my head that if I get my toe stubbed on something, I'm going to be very upset that I didn't wear something that were covering my toes up. So I just let you in on a little secret of my life. If you see me wearing flip-flops, you're going to know that's a strange day. Because I'm walking around carefully, I don't want the getting my toes stubbed or kicking my toenail off or something like that. I don't want that. So I walk around carefully. That's the picture here that Paul's saying. He says, okay, as you're walking around doing life, be very careful how you live. Walk carefully. The old King James Version was circumspectly. Diligence, vigilance, looking around. Why? Because he says the days are evil. But then he goes on here. And there is a plural. And this is what I want you to see in this section here, okay? Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine. Uh, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. All these sort of things. This is actually a plural section. In other words, what he's telling us as the church, what Paul was telling the church is he says, I want you to help each other walk around carefully. And including in your walking around carefully, guess what? You're going to need encouragement along the way. And so what are you supposed to do for each other, with each other? Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making music in your heart to the Lord. You see, the idea of music and the church go hand in hand. 
And so when the church gathers, when we come together, we encourage each other. We, we, we build each other up by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Reminders to each other of why it matters. Reminding each other to make the most of every opportunity. Because the days we're living in are evil. I want you to turn to another passage. 2 Timothy chapter 3, please, 1 to 5. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. Just before Hebrews. First and second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, but Second Timothy chapter three. Verse one. But mark this there will be terrible times in the last days. So now we just, in Ephesians, we wrote about the days are evil. Now we're talking here about the last days. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. It's interesting that he pulls out this, you know, if, if we were to look at verses 1 to 4, we would say, well, yeah, it's obvious it's like this. I mean, the last days have been going on since Paul's day, right? That's just human nature, right? But it's, what's, what's interesting here is that it seems to be focusing on this idea of godliness in the passage. That the idea was that we are being godly and yet we're still living this way. They have a form of godliness, but they're denying the power of it. Years ago, years ago, I had a conversation with uh, Dave Gruby, actually, about this passage. And we talked about it, and it's interesting that if you were to go through there, it almost seems as if these are counterfeit people. Just as Janus and Drombres were probably, possibly, the magicians who were with, with Moses and Pharaoh. If you remember back there, remember Moses was before Pharaoh, and he says, let me show you what God's power can do. And so he does this. And then the magicians, what did they do? They did the same thing, right? At least up to a point. Then finally they couldn't keep up. But they did this. They had a form of power, but yet they denied the real source of their power, which was the devil himself. I think what this passage is getting at is this is talking about this is what the church is going to look like. This isn't what the world's going to look like. They're going to be those within the church. And so within the church, these things are going to become commonplace. How many people struggle with lovers of themselves in the church today? How about lovers of money? Anybody in the church love money? How about uh, proud, boastful? How about disobedience to their parents? All of our kids perfect here today? You see, it, what, what's interesting is as time goes on, it begins to say, wow, Paul's saying in the last days, this is what the church is even going to look like. The people of God are not going to be different than what the rest of the world is. The people of God are going to look just like the rest of the world. Paul says, those are the last days. Is it possible that we're living in the last days? I want you to turn in your Bibles to one more passage. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. We've looked at the days and how the days are evil. Paul warns us about the last days. But here in Hebrews chapter 3... We find a word that's actually used quite often. Verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Well, I tell you, I read this verse, and just in preparation, I thought, man, does this not speak so clearly to what all of us need? How many of you have been deceived by sin? I tell you, we just got done with our community building month time. You're missing out if you're not coming. It's so good, 930. I encourage you to come. We had some individuals share their story. Powerful. But here's what happened. As they shared their story, for each one of them, there was pain. 
And you know what else there was pain? Along with the pain? There was this thing called shame. There was shame. And shame says, if anybody knew what I really was doing, they wouldn't accept me. They wouldn't love me. They wouldn't want me. I would be laughed at, ridiculed, mocked. And therefore, I'm never going to share that. What's interesting though, that sort of shame, that sort of pain, drives us further and further and further away from the people that God has put on this earth to help us. And so we sit and we suffer in silence. And sin says, thank you. Because when the dark is on, when the lights are out, the boogeyman feels awfully big. And that sin seems overwhelming. And that shame seems impossible to talk about. And yet when you step into the light and you say, God, I'm going to make a courageous step and I'm going to come into the light. What we find is that God loved us the whole time anyway. And what we oftentimes find is there's a group of people, hopefully, what the body of Christ is meant to be. A group of people who are willing to say, we love you anyway. Thank you for sharing. And the reason we come together and the reason why we need the encouragement is so that the darkness of sin doesn't keep pounding us and beating us and doing that thing to us. But we're scared, right? The deceitfulness of sin wrecks us. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, he says, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Instead, encourage one another daily. You know what I mean by encourage? Pat on the back, kick in the pants. A willingness to say, I love you. I care about you. I want a journey with you. I hope that's a message you hear from Frontline Bible Church. If you're battling with something, you're holding something inside today, please don't have to feel like you have to hold on to it any longer. Sin is deceitful. It is, and it will hold you captive. Encourage one another daily. As long as it is called today, it's never too late until today is over. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, we need each other to make the most of today. Let me speak to maybe some of you who are just right on the edge maybe of sharing something. I encourage you to do it because it is not too late. Today is here and if there's something you want to share, I encourage you, I'll be down front. I'll talk to you afterwards. You can set up an appointment with me this week. I'd be more than happy to talk to you to get you some encouragement to help you in your journey. I want to help you make the most of today. We go on to the next one, though. Not only are we need ongoing encouragement to make the most of today, and we all need it, but we all need ongoing encouragement to be ready for the day. If you go back to this verse in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews says, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Well, what's this day that's approaching? What is he even talking about here? What's the, the, the day that he's referencing? Well, the writer of Hebrews, you've got to realize, the writer of Hebrews was, was a Jew. He was looking forward to this reinstatement of God's program with the nation of Israel. And so as he's looking forward, he realizes, I'm a Jew. I realize that the nation of Israel is, is, has, has been set aside by this point in time. And as he looks down the road, he knows that there's a day coming when God is going to make it right. There are so many, many, many scripture passages that we could turn to. We'd have an awful lot of fun, at least a lot of us would, have a lot of fun talking through it and digging into this, but we just don't have the time. So I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version here of what's coming down the pike, okay? Because I think if you know what's coming down the pike, hopefully it reminds you that God may look like he's not acting right now, but he's patiently waiting. And so what is this whole thing? Well, I, I, I thought about it like this. How many of you ever heard the words, wait till your father gets home? 
How many of you ever heard those words before? <clears throat> I know I did. I definitely heard those words. You know, if my mom and I, especially as I got older, there wasn't a real fear of my mom, but there was a fear of my dad. <laughs> there, that was truly there. And so it, there, was, there were times when, you know, there'd be mom and dad, when mom and I would be going at it, and she would just simply say, okay, that's it. All right, wait till your father gets home. <gasps> no, 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 don't tell dad. <laughs> Because the realization was that dad was going to deal with things, but he wasn't going to deal with it yet. And so I had time, and I had some time maybe to deal with things, you know, maybe clean the house a little brighter or whatever it was so that my mom wouldn't say, whatever it took, you know. Because when dad was coming home, the wrongs were going to be righted. That's the way it was. And that's kind of the picture here. You see, the nation of Israel had been beat up. They had been in captivity under the Romans. They had been in captivity under the Greeks. Because they had turned their backs on God, God says, okay, this is what you want? All right, you're going to be ruled over. The Bible refers to it as the times of the Gentiles. You have the nation of Israel and everybody else is the Gentiles. And so the, the Gentiles were ruling over Israel. And the nation of Israel hated this. I mean, loathed it. They were waiting for the day when the Messiah was going to come and he was going to come back, he was going to kick buck, take names, and he was going to knock these Romans out of it, Jerusalem especially, but out of Israel, and they were going to be the dominant people again. So there was this messianic fervor, this fever. Hence the reason why when Jesus, if you remember, in Palm Sunday, when he came riding in under, into Jerusalem, they were like, Hosanna. Remember we sang the song this morning. Hosanna, Jesus, that you will save. That's save us was the picture. Why? Because they longed for the day when wrongs would be right. And they kept saying, oh, you pick on us, but God's going to deal with you. But he wasn't. Oh, you pick on us, God's going to deal with you. But he wasn't. And so they're struggling. Eventually, it was almost like, you know what? Maybe God's never going to come back. What happens if me as a kid who, oh, I love my mom, I just didn't fear my mom like I should. What would happen if dad wasn't around? Would I be motivated at all? Would there be anything inside of me that says, I really maybe should turn my ways? Oftentimes what would happen is I would just continue to say, well, pff, I don't need to worry about anybody. I can just keep living the way that I want to. If there's no way till your father gets home, why does it even matter? If this life is the end of it, if this coming here to uh, being on this earth, if at the very end all I do is turn into worm food, why would it matter the way that I live? Why would it matter? I think what the writer of Hebrews is saying, it does matter. Because there is a day coming when God is going to make things right. And so this is what's going to happen. There's going to be an order of events, and we have to, we're not going to turn there to all these passages. Like I said, there's a ton of them. But the next event on the prophetic timeline is this thing called the rapture. Now, if you skim through your Bible, you're not going to find the word rapture in it. I promise you. But you will find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you want to turn there. 1 Thessalonians 4, you're going to find a little expression there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. There's your word, the rapture. That, word, that expression, caught up, is the word in Latin, it's the word rapturus, from which we get our word rapture. It means to be caught up or snatched up picture of the raptor as he's flying over snatching you up okay that's the, that's the idea okay so as as the as you're being snatched up out of the earth jesus is waiting for us in the air now the reason why we understand this is different from the second coming is because in here it specifically says he will meet us in the air he's going to meet us in the air but yet at the second coming which is what we read about in the early part of acts jesus says i'm going to return to this mountain just the way i came and so the rapture is a catching away of all those who are believers as we go up as like this massive Hoover vacuum sucks us all right out of here. And what's left is all unbelievers who are left. 
Those who know Jesus Christ are caught up to those who have already died to be with the Lord forever. And then right after that, we go right into this time period called the tribulation. As I would describe it, it's like seven, three and a half years of bad and three and a half years of worse. It's kind of the way it is. Seven years that this tribulation is going to last. And if you want to be confused thoroughly, just read the book of Revelation. Uh, there is an awful lot going on in there. As the Bible talks about what is going to be taking place and so much imagery. And, but all we know is that it's going to be bad. In fact, in one passage it tells us there will be those in the tribulation who are asking to die. But it says death will elude them. One of the most amazing things in my mind is I think, um, when I think of bad thunderstorms, I think of hailstorms. The Bible says that during this tribulation period, there will be a time in which there will be hundred pound hailstones falling on people. Can you imagine what it would be like to have hundred pound hailstones falling from the sky? Do you think there would be panic and things like that going on on this earth? I can't even imagine. And yet this is what's going to happen during this tribulation as God is going to deal with the world. And people are waiting and they're like, oh my goodness, it's so bad, it's so bad, it's so bad. And God says, I got it. Do you trust me? I got it. I'm going to make it right. That's what the day is all about. So we got the rapture. We got the tribulation period. And then at the end of seven years, when it looks like Israel is completely surrounded, you've heard of the expression Armageddon. There's a real plain in Israel called the Valley of Jezreel. And it's this long plain, and there is a city there on the valley of Jezreel, and it's the city by the name of Megiddo. Har Megiddo. And so you've got this Armageddon, and that's where it says the nations are going to gather, and they're going to be ready to pounce on Israel. And Israel is going to be a goner for sure until Revelation chapter 19. The rider comes in on his white horse, and that rider is none other than, Je other than Jesus Christ himself. And it says that in there, the blood is going to be up to the bridles of the horses. That's how much bloodshed and everything else there's going to be as this battle takes place. And so we read this, and in the mind of, of, of a Jew, as he's hearing this, he's like, God, why don't you do this now? And God says, do you trust me? Do you trust me? I got this. Why does it matter that we live for God today? Because the day is coming. We don't know when it is. Let me, say, let me share this with you. There is nothing that has to take place in the prophetic time clock for Jesus to come back today. Nothing. There are those who say, well, doesn't Israel have to be restored? Well, not really, but they kind of are. Isn't there have to be wars and rumors of wars? Well, not really, that's technically talking about the tribulation period, but there kind of are. As we look around, do you think that the world is in a state that God would say, man, I'm just not real happy with this place, do you think? The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus is going to return in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. Some have said they've calculated the twinkling of an eye. It's a twentieth of a second. That's really fast. That's how fast. Boom. Gone. There's going to be no second chances. There's nobody going to be waiting around going, Hey, as I'm going up, don't forget to tell everybody about Jesus. It's just gone. That's what it is. And therefore, the, the writer is reminding people, Listen, God's in charge. He's patient. Second Peter tells us, God is patient. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so we as believers have to remember, we have to keep in mind that Jesus is going to come back. And therefore, it matters what I do today because the day is coming. I want you to turn in your Bibles to another passage, please. Titus chapter 2. If you're in Thessalonians, just flip over a couple books to the right. Pass the Timothys to Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus 2 verse 11 says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope 
the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, which is talking about the rapture, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. In other words, he's saying to Titus here, he's saying, I know you're living on this island of Crete where all these Cretans are there and they were known as lazy slobs and gluttons and everything else. And he says, I know you're with this tough crowd, but he says, I want you to remember these things because what they need to remember is as long as it is today, we can deal with things because the day is going to be coming when there's going to be no more chances. And so that's my same encouragement to you. That's my same encouragement that's my same encouragement to you. It's the same thing in my life. We need to be ready. We need to be aware because the day is here, the day to be able to live for Jesus Christ. And the day is coming. The day is coming when Jesus is going to come back. And if we have this thing firmly in mind, He could come back today. He could come back today. It motivates us to say no to these sort of things because they're temporary and to say yes to the things of God. Growing up, we said that a lot. I remember saying often, people, my family would leave. You can tell we were a pastor's family. Because one of us would leave and we would say this expression, see you there or in the air. Some of you may be pastor's families too. Okay? But that was, there was an awareness, this thing. But I'm telling you this, the longer it takes for Jesus to come back, it's easy to get sloppy, isn't it? If I told you and I knew... I don't, but if I did, he's coming back tomorrow. How many of you might change your life a little bit? But if I said he's coming back in a thousand years, how many of you might change your life a little bit? I've got time, right? The truth of the matter is, we don't know when the day will be here, but we know it's coming. And so I want to encourage you today. Christians need ongoing encouragement from each other. Do you have somebody in your life? Do you have somebody that's walking with you, journeying with you? Somebody that you've let into your life so that they really know the real you. Not the superficial fake you that shows up on Sunday mornings maybe. But that real you that's inside in which you're willing to say, Yeah, I don't have my act completely together. Yeah, I have struggles. I have struggles with this. I have struggles with that. Man, we need this ongoing encouragement from each other. And I hope that you look out for that. There's a quote that I have read and many times. Maybe you've seen this before. A guy by the name of C.T. Studd is his name. Great last name. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's this reminder. It is today. But the day is coming when God is going to make things right. Will we be ready? And will we live today like we're ready? And so here's my homework for you. And this is what I, what I hope for. Are you prioritizing meeting together as the church? Are you prioritizing are, are, are you making it a part of your schedule, a part of your routine? And by meeting together, I'm not just talking about showing up for a Sunday morning service. Don't misunderstand me. What I'm talking about is knowing and being known by a group of people who care about you and you care about them. I love all of you as members of the body of Christ. But I have the privilege of journeying with a few, a few people here at Frontline Bible Church who know me and they accept me just the way that I am. My faults, my failures, everything. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have them speaking into my life. If you're looking for somebody, a few people who would do that, I would love to put you in contact with some. Because we want this to be a church. That's truly about helping people live today in light of the day when Jesus is coming back. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. God, I want to thank you for 
the opportunity that we have to be the church. I thank you for this church, this church that we call Frontline Bible Church. We are simply a, a, a local gathering of the church, the body of Christ. And boy, I tell you, there's just so many Christians who are missing the boat when it comes to being the church. They think that being the church means just simply showing up on a Sunday. But being the church is so much more like we talked about with the gang. It's, a, it, it's about a, a family. It's about people who, who love and are loved and who care about each other and journey with each other and, and, and follow up with each other and don't let others drown. But they're there for them. And so I just pray that if somebody's here today that just truly needs the love of Christ shown through a body, that they would feel that today. And if there are those who are here who just need a little bit of a kick in the pants, that they're living life, a double life, or whatever it is, God, I just pray that today would be the day when they willingly say, I need help. Because we want to be your church. We want to be the representation of what you do in this world. So we love you, and we thank you for loving us. May we truly be frontline Bible Church. In Jesus' name we pray. And all those in agreement said, Amen.